Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. David Higgins, he's given me about 20 minutes or so of his time to talk about a potential next fight for Joseph Parker. We're talking about the location and how it would, um, and this all came about on social media and I'll come to that in a moment, but also it could be a pay-per-view, not on DAZN as some had speculated, it could be outside of his current contract as a stay busy fight during the pandemic, etc. So that's later in the interview, sort of more 10 minutes and onwards onto it. We talk about the opponent. And I also throw a couple of other things at him. Is there any interest in potential Michael Hunter fight? Other things like that. So the first 10 minutes or so is David Higgins talking about what an event for a city in New Zealand, wherever it's taken, could mean. And how all this came about was there was a reporter, um, Andrew Gordy, you can see here, this is his tweet. Queenstown has effectively ground to a halt. It needs events to get the local economy moving. Joseph Parker would normally fight overseas. He can't. This is a rare opportunity to host one of his fights in New Zealand. This is a no-brainer. So I'd say to that, well, he's fought about 75% of his fights in New Zealand, so it's not that rare. Uh, in terms of recently, yeah, it's a bit rarer. Uh, but in terms of, I was just looking at that going, well, how does that make sense if it's an event that could have less than 100 people because of current restrictions? It's a one-night event. The borders are closed, and you can see my tweet here. I don't get it. If only 100 can attend due to current restrictions, how does this event get the local economy moving? Are they hoping thousands travel to stand outside the venue? New Zealand's border is closed, so no influx of tourists. Smells more like sniffing out a site fee to offset costs. And some of the reason for saying that as well is that the government, New Zealand government, has sort of put a package together where they're looking to get sports going again. And obviously there could be some money for an event like this. This is the sort of rationale for the local sort of area, Queenstown, wanting to maybe have this. They can get a bit of uh, government support to put it on. So that is the context. And further down, so the reporter, he couldn't actually answer the questions that I was posing. So he sort of said, David Higgins, can you answer this? And he said, this bloke is welcome to call me if he wants an interview to discuss it. So less than an hour after that tweet, I called him and we did discuss it. So that is the, the setup. And now here is the interview. So as I say, the first 10 minutes or so is David Higgins talking about where the benefits come from, from staging an event in a place like Queenstown, for example. And he does say that I'm, I'm being negative, but I do sort of pose the question, well, it's not normal circumstances. It does that really sort of all this really apply. But then we get on to the other things from about uh, the 10 minute mark onwards. Where are we at in terms of a, a potential venue for a Joseph Parker fight, maybe in August or September? Well, we're looking at various options. Um, I mean, we, we haven't confirmed any fight will happen yet. Uh, there's a few boxes to check. First of all, can it be done safely? Um, and, you know, we, we put together a plan for that that we think is pretty robust. Then second, is it economically viable? I.e., does the revenue, will the revenue be more than the costs? And that's the due diligence we're doing at the moment, and that includes where would we put the fight and how much support would there be versus what the costs would be. And just in terms of that, I had seen that Queenstown was sort of uh, pushing for the event to be there and hoping the government may pump in some money. Would that be some sort of, what, site fee to, to help get the event going, or does that feed into the making it um, viable in terms of the finances? Well, it, it, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing. If you think of revenue as a pie, and, you know, pay-per-view revenue or, or broadcast is a slice of the pie, ticket revenue is a slice of the pie, sponsorship the slice of the pie, international television, food and benefit, uh, maybe government or local body contribution. It's all part of the pie, and if you lose some of the pie, you've got to replace it with some, somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, um, at the moment, um, let's be realistic, tourism and events are the hardest hit industries. I think airlines, who are also very um, uh, hit hard, will, will get... Uh, more likely to get bigger government support, and um, and you, as you can see, you know they're already operating again. Many are uh, so events. I think it's still a cap of a hundred, and you know having been down in Queenstown recently, it, the local economy is decimated, um, harder hit than hospitality, and so I think um, it's got to be realistic when there's a big when there's big lolly scrambles going on in governments around the world. Why the hell 
hit the hardest hit industries also get support. So just explain it to me, though, because this was obviously the basis of my um, tweet on Twitter. Um, I was looking at it. This is an event that could be for 100 people. Um, how does a one day event um, get the Queenstown economy um, going, as a, a reporter from News Hub had suggested? Yeah. So uh, the, the first fallacy is to see it as a one day event. It's not. It's a promotion, um, including um, an event. But the promotion would be about, oh, let's say, 12 weeks or three months in length, and it would be worldwide. Um, so the media coverage that ensues would put the location, the chosen location on the map, not just to New Zealanders, but to the countries the opponents are from, likely Australia, and also where there's an interest in other broadcast interests around the world. Now, what that would do is put the location top of mind for the traveller for when they do decide to travel again, especially if there's some interesting, fun footage of someone admired, like, for example, Joseph Parker bungeeing that will be going around the world now. You might have people going, oh, I'd love to go get get away from, you know, the misery and get down to, say, Queenstown or New Zealand when the time is right. That's one benefit. Then leading in, it will be a driver for domestic tourism. With that number of tickets, the tickets will have to be fairly pricey, but there is accessibility and most people will be able to watch on television. But, you know, you're in the, um, attracting perhaps investors into the local economy or people that will stay a week or two weeks and spend money, might buy property. So there's a GDP investment element. Leading into the event, there's rounds and rounds of media coverage week to week to week that are putting that location top of mind. Um, heading into the event, we're hoping the numbers might increase from 100 up to 500, maybe more. So you might see even more tourism come in. Um, obviously, local suppliers are on their knees. Um, accommodation providers, event companies, sound, lighting, staging, venues are decimated and laying people off with no revenue at all in many cases, the hardest hit of any industry. And so an event like this does pump money into the local economy if you're losing, using local suppliers. Um, then the week itself, there's a, you'd have everyone in town, potentially you might even have you know, the, the, the top ring announcer like a Michael Buffer here, um, the eyes of the world will be on the location because people around the world are craving live sports, broadcasters crave content. The week of activity, weigh in official press conferences, you'd have public figures from around the world potentially doing tourism activities. Uh, the, the broadcast itself would be a, a live um, telecast, maybe three, four hours in length, and in it you would knit vignettes promoting. New Zealand potentially and the location and fun things to do and you might have people like Joseph Parker doing such things. That broadcast would be watched by the statistics suggest over a million New Zealanders who would then, you know, because they can't spend their tourism money elsewhere, they might spend it internally, which again creates jobs, uh, money suppliers, gets the economy going, and at the same time that footage, um, our partners, our, the promotional partners, Matt Shroom, could probably get the footage out to dozens if not a hundred countries including most likely British Sky Sport Live and not pay-per-view. So you would have, um, I'd say in the hundreds of millions, maybe more with their eyes on New Zealand and on the destination and telling a good news story about looking after each other bringing back the economy, bringing back events in a safe way, giving people hope and entertainment. So I think you're very wrong to cast such an effort in a negative light. Um, the, the, the alternative is for Joseph Parker to not fight for more than a year and then all event companies go bust, let the suppliers go bust and just sit on their hands and do nothing whilst we dish out money to many other industries. So I, I think you need to have another careful look at it. I'm not trying to cast anything in a negative light. I'm not trying to ask a sort of question because you do paint a, a very sort of pretty sort of narrative there, but is it under current circumstances which aren't normal because i could see a normal event where you can attract thousands of people and there's no travel restrictions people are more likely say from overseas they could see it they can book tickets but some of that sort of stuff at the moment is on hold because it's a very different world that's that's why i was sort of asking the question you know yeah, you're how right to... about that you're, you're, you're right about that i mean the, the, it's, we're in an unusual situation where um if we waited i mean i don't think 
normal events might not be possible for the whole year, maybe even into next year, we don't know. So we, we could either just do nothing and, and then more people lose their jobs, Joseph's out of the ring, gets ring, rusty people don't get to see um, their role models in action, etc. Um, and it makes things worse, really. And so then it's a case of, well, what can we do, if anything? And so what we're doing now is due diligence um, to see if we can, in fact, mount a promotion coming out of the pandemic. Um, and yes, whilst live attendee numbers are going to be down, the t- broadcast uh, viewer numbers are going to be up, and the suppliers and people working on it are going to need, need the, um, the uh, employment, et cetera, more than ever. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, we're not... Um, And in, in terms of the potential interest uh, in a fight, obviously, um, you've looked at some um, some names that have sort of obviously been uh, in the media, Lucas Brown, Dempsey McKean, possibly Junior Far too. Um, is it that, uh, are those names still the options being considered or are other options uh, sort of in the mix at the moment? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, the, the, you look at some of the comments around the place and people think it's a, um, a zero-sum game sort of thing. The, the reality is that the, the I think the massive names in the world, you know, the Anthony Joshua's, the Tyson Fury's, etc. I don't see them fighting in this sort of bubble scenario because they've made so much money in their career and get paid so much for each fight that I'll just, I'd say they'll sit it out and just wait till things return to normal. So you're talking um, you know, copy next year for the big, big fights. Then I think there's a category of fighters who actually need the money to, to pay their rent, to feed their families, and they'll be looking at what, what any opportunities they can get and f- fighting for lesser amounts. And I, um, and then I'd say there's a sort of a middle ground. Um, guys like Joseph, that um, you know, he's dedicated and wants to keep busy. I mean, all boxers want to box. Um, and, and then can regional matchups be put together that make sense? Um, in this case, um, were it not for the pandemic, Joseph would be off in the United States or Europe seeking to fight the likes of Chisora or Dillian White or Pivetkin or, or maybe an Andy Ruiz rematch, any of that ilk. Um, do, being realistic, because of the pandemic, do we then, we can't do that, do we look at something more regional? And, and uh, the truth is that um, uh, Junior Farr has been calling out Joseph Parker for a long time, using his name to get his name out there, but he's um, not realistic about the demands here. You know, we're in a pandemic. The guys that get busy are the ones that are realistic. Everyone's taking pay cuts. My staff are much reduced pay, as are many others in many industries. So the boxers that want to fight will understand the economics and not be seeking the massive bucks. But then you'll get some that are ignorant and have no idea we're in a pandemic or don't understand the economics of it and are looking to get paid more than ever, well, they, they simply won't be offered the opportunity because it just doesn't work. Um, and then you've got, say, Lucas Brown. He's probably the most experienced possible opponent for Joe in this part of the world. They nearly fought once or twice before the Joshua fight. The Lucas Brown fight was nearly put together. Um, if you look at his record on paper, he's only got, I think, a couple of losses to quite good names, including Dillian White. And he's, he's fight first. He had a fight booked for Vegas on 29 March, I think, that couldn't go ahead because of the pandemic. So um, he's actually, you know, first, and it's not a short notice scenario that he's come into in the past. You've got Dempsey McKean calling out Joseph Parker. Um, he hasn't fought anywhere near the opposition Lucas Brown has, but still, he's an up and coming guy that's unbeaten. So I guess my job or our job at the moment. Um, We've got permission of Matchroom to look at do this due diligence. We're now looking at can we make a budget work, and part of that is again talking to the possible locations of venues. And obviously, with the the list of names, uh, those three that we've already talked about, um, in terms of where Joseph Parker is at in his career, he's on a whole nother level to the likes of Lucas Brown, Dempsey McKean, and Junior Farr. 
uh, does part of that due diligence look at obviously um, the opponent probably not something uh, someone Joseph Parker would if he was to have a 50 50 these guys wouldn't be in the equation is, is part of that due diligence looking at the the appetite for a fight where some people may see this as a bit of a mismatch with one of those three names yeah well look I, I think to a Cameron was a mismatch <laughs> and you know the, the media dubbed it the fight of the century um, it, it's still in the top three audiences in New Zealand box, boxing history if not sporting history then you look at Anthony Joshua versus Andy Ruiz Jr um, the rematch oh, the, oh, sorry that Madison Square Garden New York I was there everyone called it a mismatch and then Judy uh, um, Ruiz really dominated Joshua and put him away um, so what's the lesson there really in the heavyweight division any heavyweight who's fit can knock out another heavyweight it's just the nature of the physics involved the, the size and weight and punches etc they've all got knockouts on their records so you know Lucas isn't old um, you know he's he's still he's coming to the end of his career but he's he's fully fit he's good on paper and you know we'd have to take him seriously um, you know many times we've seen um, people decide the opponents that you know an underdog or mismatch and an upset happens so, you know, yeah, we, we, we just have to take every opponent on merit. And, um, and it's a question of who's willing to step up and can we make it a fist of the promotion. And just on the promotion, because obviously there's a question among fans. I mean, I've certainly spoken about on my um, boxing channel and a number of commenters have been sort of ruminating about, is this going to be an event where it would be a Sky Sports pay-per-view or would this be an event where it could be the launch uh, for DAZN? And obviously the fans are sort of talking about that. Are you able to sort of um, sort of add anything to sort of clear that up? Yeah, well, Joseph's not on the contract with any New Zealand broadcaster at the moment. The incumbent broadcaster of Sky Television. So, of course, we would be having discussions in the first instance with Sky Television. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting environment out there, and um, many broadcasters are struggling, and I'm sure Sky are as affected as is everyone else. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm due to talk to Sky TV this week, and, um, and then we'll go from there. And Joseph obviously had um, a three-fight deal with DAZN, and many were expecting this was going to be the third fight of this. So are you you telling me that you've got some sort of exemption to maybe fight outside of that contract for this one-off regional fight? Yeah, I think that that will be the way to do it. Um, The match will be pretty supportive, and I think the um, logical way to do it is to seek some sort of release to do this event on the side, to keep Joseph busy and keep everyone in, in business um, and then return to fulfil the third fight on the matchroom contract. That would be the sensible way to do it. In terms of a New Zealand pay-per-view, so that was that is what you're looking at at this point. Would that feature potentially um, New Zealand and Australian-based fighters or just potentially at all New Zealand undercarters? What are you looking at in yeah. terms of that? Well, well, there's talk of this trans-Tasman bubble or at least open flights across the Tasman um, so we, we're looking at New Zealand and Australian fighters at the moment um, and we, we want to create you know, as good as an undercard as we can in the current climate so um, yes we're looking at a New Zealand Australia scenario but we, we're having to do different model scenario modelling you know, if the border doesn't open or it gets too hard do we look at New Zealand only bar the main event who we quarantine um, if um, the limit on numbers goes up from 100 to 500, um, we, you know, a different budget for that. So it's actually, um, there's a few decisions to be made, a few complications behind the scenes. So I had noted that the uh, Maloney brothers in Australia had got an exemption to travel and fight in the United States uh, in June or July. Uh, they're sort of waiting on which card they'd be on, but they will be over there. Is, is there any sort of um, thought that you might explore something like that, given that the better matchups will be over there? The trouble is that a, a Parker versus a Chisora or a Dilly White or a Pavetkin um, or, Lewis or, or an Usyk um, that would sell out O2 Arena in London, for example, and be, you know, a big event. Um, so, I, does it make sense? Say, or, you know, I think Usyk, if, if Joshua 
vacated WBO belt, Usyk Parker would potentially be for the world title. Um, it doesn't really make sense to do that on Eddie Hearn's lawn. And I, I think it's great what Eddie's doing, and I can't wait to see it play out. But I don't think it makes sense to do the, the blockbuster events in front of a small audience. So, I, yeah, I, I think if we if Joe's going to leave his three um, young babies under um, four and and then travel and be away all that time, um, it would need to be for quite a big, um, very meaningful fight. Is, is there any thought, because uh, you've mentioned names like White, Chisora, Pavek and Usyk and that, um, a guy that's been calling out um, Joseph Parker quite a bit recently, so is his manager too, Martin Mich- uh, Mikhailajic, um, is Michael Hunter. Is there any interest in that fight? Yeah, I'm not at the... Mo- well, you know, Joseph has shown that he'll fight anyone and, and, you know, he hasn't really stepped away from any big challenges and he's had a few uh, bad rubs of the green in terms of officiating, etc. Uh, but, you know, he, 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 you won't discuss it with him. He'll, find, he'll go back in against rules, he'll find anyone. So if Hunter was the right guy and it made economic sense and so on, then absolutely we'd discuss that. But at the moment, there's been no formal discussion of that. And I guess um, there's some pros and cons with um, having a New Zealand-based event at this point. Um, obviously, the pros being that it's activity, it's a, a payday. It's like you said, wherever it goes, there will be some benefit. Obviously, um, you'll be involved. Your company has some benefit too. Um, but in terms of a downside, if it is perceived to be, at least by some fans, not a competitive enough fight, that that could sort of rub off the wrong way on Joseph Parker. Are you a little bit concerned about that, given that um, you had the likes of the Joshua and White fights and it's been a bit quiet since then? Yeah. So, look, the reality is I think 90% of the fans who are intelligent and can read and write and follow current affairs will realise that we're in a pandemic. And if they're real Joseph Parker fans, they'll like to see Joseph keeping busy fit, active for the sake of his career, um, rather than doing nothing for a year, which is career damaging. And I understand that due to the situation we all in, that um, we're going to put on the best show we can, and they'll be supportive. Then you'll get a sort of ignorant 10% who stick their heads in the sand and expect Joseph to be having a rematch with Anthony Joshua, even though we're in the middle, middle of the pandemic. So, you know, people will self-select on whether they're understanding of the situation and actually supportive of Joseph Parker or whether they're just going to throw stones and ignore the pandemic and demand that Joseph be, you know, fighting for the title again right now. Um, It'll be interesting to see it play out, but it's nothing we're not used to. In terms of a potential pay-per-view in New Zealand on Sky, obviously right now some people are doing it tougher, you know, maybe not working as many hours or it's a bit tighter financially. Uh, how, will, how will that sort of factor into the sort of price point for the event? If, look, um, if, if it does go on Sky, we've had pay-per-views on Sky range from thirty nine ninety five up to, I think from memory, Fifty nine or maybe sixty nine ninety five for the rulers world title fight. Um, now um, thirty nine ninety five was the, the David to Shane Cameron price, which was a decade ago. And so, um, if, you, if you take the inflationary effect, that price now is probably worth about thirty bucks. Anyway, I'm not confirming anything now because we haven't formalised any broadcast arrangements. But given the circumstances, I, I'd expect the price to be at the lower end of the range. And is there any thought to, I know you said you're going to be meeting with um, Sky New Zealand, any thought to maybe um, having a meeting with Spark, because obviously they're looking to get into the sports, um, or more into the New Zealand sort of sports market, beyond cricket and other things that they've had, like the Rugby World Cup pass? We've had no formal discussions with Spark at this point in time, and so we'll be talking to Sky this week, and then going from there. And is there anything else that um, you think is important to mention at this point that you think fans should be aware of or know? Not really. I mean, you're welcome to keep in touch um, and um, let's hope we can get this off the ground. But look, if it, if it looks unsafe or it looks like it's going to lose a fortune, then we'll probably 